Okay, I think we should get started. Um, <clears throat> thank you everyone for being here today. Um, this is the last lecture in the second module of the Bread PhD course on credit insurance and risk. Uh, and my second lecture, second and last lecture uh, under kind of the topic of digitization um, and you know digital transfer. So um, today what I wanna do is build on the class that we taught or that I taught yesterday talking about the impacts of mobile money and talk about whether there's broader gains to digitization, um, especially digitization that integrates with the financial sector in some way. And so that's the plan for today. <clears throat> I will reiterate the caveat I had yesterday. I'm still a little under the weather. So uh, I apologize in advance if I have to stop for a second here and there and just cough and, and sort that out. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, you know, the question that after we kind of think through these payment systems and the gains of payment systems, the next question that comes up or that people want to think about is, can payment systems bring some of the benefits of traditional banking, right? So it's just a payment system so far, but is there a way to leverage that payment system to get back some of the gains of traditional banking, especially when traditional banking is hard to access for people? So the sort of topic for today is whether digital payments can enable broader banking, for example, credit, and what are the interactions with the bank, formal banking system? So I'll cover kind of three big topics if I can today. One is thinking about fully digital banking uh, and whether this is a, this is sort of a, a venue for getting gains, uh, getting greater, greater gains to the, the rails of mobile money that we talked about yesterday. And then I'll talk about interactions with the public sector. Um, and whether there's digitization opportunities in the public sector. And then I'll kind of talk about things we know about how, you know, not just the public sector and digitization, but once you can digitize payments uh, and bring the formal banking system in, does this do something more or less? So that's kind of the plan for today um, to think about broader gains to digitization and where they might lie as we start to digitize transfers of all different types. So I'm gonna start off talking about a paper that I have with Prashant Bardwaj at San Diego and William Jack at Georgetown on uh, fully digital banking. This is around a product called Mshwari in Kenya. Um, you know, the promise of mobile is that a traditional microfinance has very low take up rates. And I'll show you, uh, <coughs> I'll show you a table of those in a minute. Um, they also have high costs of delivery. So you need to reach out to people to, to sort of access it. You know, there's lots of these group meetings which might impose costs of, you know, higher costs of access. So instead, what we're gonna study is a fully digital bank account on a mobile phone. What do I mean by fully digital? It means um, the account is opened on a mobile phone. It's not a smartphone, it's still a dumb phone. Um, and it uses the rails of mobile money, which means if I wanna put money into my bank account, I put money into my mobile money account, and then I move it from this mobile money account costlessly into a bank account. Okay, so the bank account is kind of completely digital. Um, you, get, you can save over your mobile phone just by putting money through, the, through your mobile money account. Again, if you wanna withdraw, you're gonna do the reverse transaction where the money goes from the bank account into mobile money for free, and then you withdraw from mobile money. Um, and then they use, they also disperse credit digitally, okay? There's no real tellers. There's no way to really apply for a loan. Um, they're gonna credit score you and I'll talk about the credit score in a second and then disperse loans as you request them. There's no brick and mortar bank, bank branches. There's no tellers and there's no loan officers. Okay, and the idea is this sort of banking could lower the costs, <coughs> excuse me, dramatically for both the customers and the lenders. Okay, the lenders don't need to have brick and mortar branches. Um, they don't need to have tellers. And for the customers, you don't need to travel to a bank branch. You don't need to fill in paperwork. Um, you don't need to kind of meet with loan officers, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of the, the, the sort of product we're studying. I will say there's been a big push towards trying to do this in a bunch of countries. Kenya was again, one of the early ones to do this but it is these sorts of uh, products exist in a, in a number of countries now. Okay, um, and by the way, I should have said this earlier, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. Um, this becomes more fun if there's interaction, so please feel free to jump in and I'll try and take questions as they come. 
Okay, so this is take up rates of traditional microfinance. Um, you can see kind of, this is of the people offered a microfinance loan, how many take it, um, you know, in Mexico from Compartama, Compartamos, which I can never say properly, sorry. Uh, the take up rate is 4%. In Peru, it's close to 8%. In South Africa, close to 9%. Um, so these are pretty low take up rates across the board. Much as we think of microfinance as being a really big deal, the reality is that take up rates tend to be quite low. So in this context, we're gonna study um, digital credit in Kenya. There's a, you know, uh, there's a bunch of lenders that are doing digital products. Some are bank led, which means that it's a fully functional bank account on your, on your mobile phone. Um, like I said, the most popular one is Mshwari that was started at the time by Commercial Bank of Africa. The Kenya Commercial Bank has one and Equity Bank has one and these all run on dumb phones. And then there's a bunch that are non-bank led. These are San Fran startups that are doing pure lending. They're not banks, so they can't offer you savings in any way, okay? So this is just lending um, and they work on smartphones. Two big examples are Branch and Talo. And all of them are, uh, are at this time offering a monthly loan of between six and 12% interest rates on the month. Okay, so these are not cheap loans, um, but they're kind of all offered digitally on your mobile phone. Okay, so that's kind of the market at the time we started studying Mshwari. I'll give you some more data on timelines in a second, but that's kind of how the market looks. You can see that um, Mshwari is by far the most popular product. KCB started catching up, but those are kind of the two big players in this market. Um, I'm sure, you know, at the time we did the study, which was a couple of years ago, they had over 15 million accounts, which means 75% of adults in Kenya had a virtual bank account. If you remember the results I showed you yesterday on the long-term effects of M-Pesa in Kenya, we saw an increase in bank accounts. A chunk of that is going to be Mshwari accounts because it's really easy to have an Mshwari account over your mobile money account. Um, and one in five Kenyans had an active loan on Mshwari. Uh, like I said, this is a 30-day loan. It has an Mshwari a, a fee of 7.5% a month. And the first loan can be as small as a dollar, but as high as $100. You know, in our data, the first average loan is about $2.5. Um, you know, the, the average loan dispersed, not the first loan, is about $5. The 90th percentile is about $10 or 1,000 shillings. And the average total loans over 18 months are about $40 the 90th percentile is close to $100, okay? So there's quite a bit of variation in loan sizes and amounts, and people often take out multiple loans. So they'll borrow, repay, and then take out again. Okay, let me talk about the credit score. Um, I'm sure he builds a credit score as a function of your, basically your data. They have a collaboration with the telco, or the bank has a collaboration with the telco, and they use data on M-Pesa transactions, airtime expenses, which is what you spend on your phone, whether you borrow airtime, uh, whether you get airtime transfers from other people. Um, and so they use this data to create a formula. This is not a machine learning credit score by any, by any uh, stretch. It's uh, just a kind of think of it as a weighted average of these variables, okay? And then they use a credit score cutoff to decide who gets a loan and who doesn't. Um, I see a question in the chat about you can, whether you can take multiple loans at the same time. No, you cannot. Um, the loan is tied to your, uh, to your mobile money account in some grand sense, and so you can't. Um, I, I guess you could get multiple phone lines and do it that way, um, but they try to prevent that by using uh, individual IDs to prevent multiple uh, mobile money accounts. So it's, it's very unusual. Okay, <clears throat> so the credit score, the way the credit score operates is they kind of do this weighted average, create a score, and then the value of the score above also maps into a credit limit. Right? So if you have a higher score, you'll have a higher limit. And then over time, the credit score is never adjusted over time. This is not like the US market where your credit score changes. They have initial credit score. And then what they do is they adjust the limit over time. And so if your credit score is below the cutoff, your limit is zero. But then over time, you can actually grow that limit. And the way you grow it is mostly by saving an mshwari. If there's savings, they'll update your credit limit. Okay, They don't change the original score. And then if you borrow and repay, of course, that will affect your credit limit in the future. Um, if you don't pay, you'll report at the credit bureau after a few months. And um, Mshwari does not have access to airtime or M-Pesa balances to be able to clear a loan. Okay, so the only way is for you to really repay the loan through Mshwari. 
Okay, so that's the product. Um, I mean, uh, what we're gonna do, let me talk about the data we're gonna use, right? Um, so what we're gonna do, sorry, um, let me just be clear, the empirical, we wanna try and understand the impact of this credit. Okay, we're not gonna say much about the savings piece, uh, but we can use the score cutoff in a regression discontinuity design. And we're gonna use that to try and understand the impacts of the credit. So we have three kind of data sets. We have administrative data from the bank on about a million clients for about 18 months. They open their accounts between Jan and March, 2015. Um, there's about 156,000 in uh, the window of the credit score, which is minus nine to plus 10. Um, what we did to try and decide how to survey was we used optimal bandwidth techniques and regression discontinuity to decide on the bandwidth. Uh, the bandwidth is minus nine to 10. And then we surveyed a subset of the people, random, a random subset of the people who are in that bandwidth, right? We didn't want to spend survey resources on people outside the bandwidth. Um, so we randomly sampled 6,000 clients from the 156,000 that, that sit in this window of minus nine to 10 in the credit score. Um, just so you know, we restricted it to people who opened their accounts between Jan and March, 2015. Uh, the survey was conducted about almost two years later, between September 2016 and Jan 2017. Um, and so this is kind of two-ish years, almost two years after people open accounts and first have access to credit. Okay, As soon as you open an account, the Mshwari kind of scores you immediately. And they don't tell you your score, uh, but they tell you your limit. So they tell you how much you're available, how much credit you have access to. All right, for the Sasold survey, we did this by phone because I'm sure he doesn't actually know where people are, everything's digital. So we did a phone survey, we got about a 70% response rate uh, and the response rate is not differential across the credit score cutoff. And then we have administrative data on the bank on folks that open their accounts later. Uh, we'll use that just to look at the evolution of loans. Great, I have a question in the chat about why minus nine to 10. Um, we used the administrative data to get optimal bandwidth for the regression discontinuity, and that was the optimal bandwidth in the, in the admin data. Okay, great. So first we check for manipulation in the cutoff, which is kind of a standard RD test. Uh, so this is the density of the credit score by these bins of minus nine to 10. Um, you know, if you thought that they were manipulating and moving some people above the credit score limit, you would see it in here, and we don't see that. Um, this is the distribution of the credit score in the administrative data. You can see it runs from minus 100 to about 200. Um, you know, if we look at the window that we're studying, the minus 9 to 10, it's about 15% of the data, okay? Just to get a sense of how many people sit in that window uh, and how much of the data we're using sort of in, in this RD framework. Okay, um, we use the later administrative sample because there we have much more detailed on data on loans. And what we do is look at, compare people who are above and below the cutoff and look at the number of loans they have since they opened the account, right? And you can see basically for people below the cutoff for the first three or four months, they just have access to no loans at all. And then of course, some get access because they're saving on the platform and that changes their limit. And so now they can borrow, but you can see that those below the cutoff kind of stay behind the people above the cutoff in the number of loans. So the way to think about our idea is not, do you get credit or not? It's, do you get more credit or less credit? Okay, and I'll show you that in the data as well, but that's the treatment here. It's not about everybody not getting credit. It's about, um, you know, getting more versus less credit. Good, Jose has a question in the chat about the same, does everybody pay the same interest rate? Yeah, the interest rate is fixed. The score does not affect the interest rate at all. It's a 7%. And they don't call it an interest rate. For the record, it's called an administrative fee. So it's a 7.5% administrative fee per loan. Okay, great. So that's the evolution of loans. Um, this is the evolution of credit limits. As you can see, uh, the credit limits start off at zero, like I said, for those below the cutoff, that's the gray line. And then they pick up and then they kind of match the total limits by 2016. But you can see that the the people who are above the cutoff have higher limits to start with. Okay, so let me show you the first stage. Do people actually get more loans or take more loans, right? Because you can imagine that even if I have a positive credit limit, I might not actually take it, right? Remember I told you microfinance was no take up. So here's whether, uh, this is from the administrative data. 
and we look at people above and below the credit score cutoff and we see whether they received an MSHWARI loan and we look at the total amount they've borrowed on MSHWARI, okay, by the end of the, the sample period that we have, which is 18 months later on the administrative data. So we do see that they're much more likely to receive an MSHWARI loan. This is almost 25, 30 percentage points higher, okay, and that's because by the end of 18 months, some people on the left, um, do have access to credit because they, they saved on MSHWARI and that changes their limit. And then the total amount you can see is almost double. They, by the end of 18 months in the administrative data, those above the credit score cutoff have borrowed almost double from MSHWARI what the, what the people below the credit score cutoff have borrowed. Okay, and then this is... <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is the same sort of first stage data from uh, from our data. Sorry, the fir same first stage plots from our survey data, and you can see the same thing. This is now not just did you receive a loan on MSHWARI, but did you receive a loan from anyone? And one of the things we're interested in is whether MSHWARI just substitutes for other credit, or whether it's actually a true expansion of credit. So this is not just MSHWARI, but all loans. So we do see a big increase in the probability you receive a loan. This is about 12, 13 percentage points. We also see an increase in the number of loans you received, which is the right picture. Uh, and then if we look at total credit, we also see a big increase in the total amount of, of debt you have or that you're able to take on, okay? So that's the first stage. This is the robustness to the bandwidth on uh, has a loan and the number of loans. So you can see kind of pretty robust results as we narrow the bandwidth. Um, okay, this is just the, the regression version of what I showed you. Uh, let me show you this piece, which is a regression version of looking at whether MSHWARI uh, substitutes for other types of loans in the data. So in column one, we show you that 13 percentage point increase in the probability you have an MSHWARI loan. You can see the control mean is kind of already 20%. So these are high take up loans. They're not low take up, right? In the, in the group above the cutoff, that's about a 34 percentage point take up, okay, which is much higher than we see in microfinance. Um, and then we look at bank loans, MFI loans, SACO loans, which are saving in credit co-ops and ROSCA loans, uh, just to see if these decrease, right? Is MSHWARI substituting some other loan? We don't see any decrease there. And then we look at other informal loans, like from your friends and family. We also don't see a decrease there. So this is creating a true expansion in credit. It's not just a substitution of other forms of credit. Okay, and you can see in the tables, I'm presenting two sets of bandwidths. One is the optimal bandwidth that we plan the study around and then half of that. Okay, so let's talk about the two big results we have. The first is resilience. We look at whether um, people who got the credit or who are above the credit cutoff are likely to forego expenses. So one way we think about resilience is we ask you, did something bad happen to you? If it did, did you have to forego expenses? Did you have to cut expenditure on meals, which is column three? Did you have to cut expenditure on medical? And did you have to cut expenditure on non-food items? Okay, and you can see across the board, these are negative, which means the guys who got credit or the guys who are above the credit score cutoff are less likely to have cut all of these expenses in response to a bad shock. Okay, um, any is just the global sort of max of all of those. Did you have to adjust or cut expenses in anything. Okay, and so we're gonna see a negative effect there. So you get this improvements in resilience, which is people borrow and then they don't have to reduce expenses to deal with a bad event. And we looked at other adjustments, whether you had to pull a child out of school, leave a job or sell assets, and we don't see much there. Okay, um, just to show you the resilience effect, this is of whether you had to cut any expenses in response to a shock. And you can see it's pretty stable across the bandwidth. Okay, so this is just the robustness to the bandwidth. And then the other piece we do is look at expenditures. So we look at total consumption, food consumption, basic consumption, education, health, clothing, assets, transport, temptation goods, alcohol, and tobacco. And the only effect we really find is on education. We find that people are more likely to spend on education. Here's the robustness of the education effect. So we see about a five percentage point increase in the probability people can spend on education. Um, so um, in this case, you know, what, what's happening is most of these shocks um, are health events, 
And so um, one of the big pieces of the health events, if you think of the, of the MPESA study we did last week, last week, yesterday, I'm used to teaching weekly, um, is you kind of get similar effects. So let me just go back and it's gonna match this question uh, that came up in, uh, in the Q&A. Um, what happens is a lot of these events are medical events and you'll see that in our sample, 89% um, of people experience a shock, okay? In fact, the shock I think is probably getting them to open an account, which is why they all have shocks, right? We're not, this is not about credit, but about the account. So we see large shares of people having shocks. And what are these shocks? A bunch of it is gonna be medical. And so one of the things that happens uh, when there's a medical event, if you remember last class, is people who have access to a financial product often use that product. So I think what's happening here is when someone gets sick, um, the people who are above the cutoff are taking out a loan to cover medical expenses um, and to cover other expenses. And the people who don't have access to the loan have to cut expenses in other places to cover that cost. <coughs> so that's what we saw in M-Pesa too, right? When there's, a, when there's a shock or a medical event, everybody pays for medical care, but the non-users of mobile money have to kind of get it from somewhere else. They have to cut other pieces. And one of the pieces they actually cut was school. And so um, we do see them cut schooling expenditures as a response to medical shocks because they need to find the money somewhere. And so that, uh, Abdul Razak, I think that's what you're seeing in the control is that um, you know, health, health beats education every, every study we do pretty much. Um, you know, health is very salient and, and beats it. Um, and I think that's why we see this increase in education expenses in the, on the right side of the cutoff. It's not just, it's not that they're actually increasing it. It's just that they're less likely to cut it. And so it's bigger than on the left side of the cutoff. Okay. All right. Um, and then we don't find much on any other sort of wealth measures. We find no effects on any wealth measures. So let me summarize just the results of what we're finding here. Um, you know, this is one of the first papers to study the effects of digital credit on outcomes. Uh, we have a large take up um, around the cutoff. 34% of those eligible take out a loan, which is pretty striking relative to microfinance. Uh, and it's much higher than other forms of financial access, even in our data, those are all one to 5%. Um, it is a true expansion of credit because it doesn't substitute for other things. And we see improved resilience and a higher propensity to spend on education, no effects on overall consumption, assets, and employment. Of course, it might be too early to see those because we're only at 18 months from your first loan. Okay, let me pause there and see if there's any questions. Otherwise, then I'll move on to the to sort of the next paper I wanted to talk about. Okay, I see no questions. So I'm gonna power on. Um, so the next piece I wanna talk about is a paper by Sean Higgins. I will say, um, I just want to give a shout out to everybody else's paper, everybody else who, whose papers I'm going to talk about. Can I say this the right way? Uh, so yesterday was Emma Riley, and today all of the next few papers are going to be other authors. Um, I just want to give them a shout out for very, very, uh, uh, you know, very happily sharing their slides with me uh, so that I could put all of this together. So a big shout out to them. So this is a paper by Sean Higgins thinking about not just kind of the individual person problem of kind of, you know, what digital does, but is there a way digital can also change a firm side of the problem? Okay, is there a companion kind of piece that, you know, if I digitize households, will firms respond and also digitize themselves? Okay, that's how I think of this. Um, you know, he phrases it as a coordination failure constraining FinTech adoption. Um, but, you know, I also think of it as this interaction between households and firms and can firms kind of get encouraged to adopt fintech when the households happen. So he's going to use a natural experiment that um, distributed in Mexico a million debit cards to cash transfer beneficiaries. Uh, and I'll talk more about this. And then he's going to combine pretty cool administrative data and household micro survey data on both consumers and firms to understand this, this sort of connection between uh, households and firms. So over 2009 uh, to 2012, Mexico's conditional cash transfer program distributed about a million debit cards. This is in urban localities only. And the idea was you could, uh, you know, you would you'd be able to use these debit cards to get your cash transfer out more easily. 
So before the intervention, um, the urban recipients of this cash transfer program would uh, receive their money in a bank account. They were paid every two months. What the intervention did is um, give them a debit card, a visa debit card attached to the account, okay? And so that way they can withdraw funds from an any ATM and they can use that debit card at now a bunch of stores to pay without having to use cash. Before they would go to the bank, withdraw cash and then spend in cash. Now they can use this debit card, okay? And they have a companion paper looking at the impacts of just that on households and trust in the banking system. If you're interested in that, <coughs> I encourage you to read it. It's a very cool paper showing that, you know, showing how households build trust in the banking system when they suddenly get a, a card like this. Today, I'm gonna restrict to kind of what this does to the firm side, okay? Okay, so basically a bunch of households got a, a way to kind of just not only get a digital transfer, but keep that transfer in a digital medium, right? In a bank account that you can transact with a card, okay? So this is just to show you debit cards per person and the proportion of retailers with POS terminals, uh, POS is point of sale. So basically, you know, I can give everybody visa cards. If I want to spend that, if I want to spend money on my visa card, it has to be that the place I spend it has that little terminal that I can swipe my card in, right? That's a POS terminal. And so here, what, what Sean is trying to study is if I give everybody debit cards all of a sudden, does this mean that then the firms or the retailers start to get POS systems because they know that everybody has debit cards and wants to use them. But if I don't have the POS system, they can't use it in my store. Okay, so that's kind of this, this kind of uh, idea that I was talking about, about how, how households adopting a FinTech can push even firms to do the same. Okay, so that's the right side is the retailers who have a POS system. And then if you look at it a few years later, you can see the big change. Okay, all right. so. Um, let me talk a bit about the POS in Mexico and how it worked, and then I'll show you some results that are pretty cool. So the POS is rented to the retailer from the bank. They need uh, the firm to have an account at that bank. And a lot of these sort of non-bank e-payment services that we think of today were just not there in Mexico at the time. Um, there's a low initial cost of the POS, but you know there's a monthly cost and for small stores, this is gonna be quite a costly thing to do. Okay, and we're gonna think about two types of stores in this. You can think of corner stores, which are these small kind of, you know, stores around the corner from your house. And then there's big supermarkets that you would drive to to do to shop. Okay, so those are just the costs. Um, not only are there monetary costs, a lot of these corner stores are, are potentially informal businesses. And they're worried that, you know, having a POS means they're more likely to get taxed. Right, because now there's a record of transactions, they're not doing it in cash. And then there's also <coughs> some costs of paperwork. Okay. okay, so this is the setup. Um, so what Sean is gonna do is use kind of a diff and diff of the rollout of the, of, the, of the bank account cards, the visa debit cards to households from the cash transfer program. Okay, and that rollout was done geographically. And so he's gonna use a diff and diff uh, to look at that and then look at what happens on the firm side, not just the household side, okay? So this is the number of corner stores that, <coughs> that have POSs. Um, and you can see the event study plot from the diff and diff. Uh, and you can see basically this growth in the number of POSs um, by about 20% over this period, okay? Over the two years post getting one of these, uh, most, post households in, in, uh, in a particular area getting their cash transfers uh, with this visa card, okay? So you see an increase in the number in the POS adoption by corner stores. You don't see an increase in supermarkets, okay? Supermarkets either mostly had them or they're really not so affected by people, you know, getting these debit cards because the, the supermarkets are not locally spread, right? They're, they're much more aggregate in some sense. And then he also looks at other POSs that are in other retailers, not in, you know, not in corner stores and not in supermarkets. And you also don't see anything there. Okay, so the big changes, as people get these um, Visa debit cards, you see this accompanying adoption of uh, corner stores using the point of sale services so they, they can serve their clients wanting to use the Visa card. Um, and then he looks at spillovers to other consumers, right? This is a conditional cash transfer. It's income targeted. 
And so there's a bunch of consumers who don't get the Visa debit cards, um, right? Because they're not part of the cash transfer program. And he looks at whether those consumers start to use debit cards and you see this spillover to other consumers who were not given the debit cards, but who start to adopt the debit cards. So it feels kind of the circular thing, right? The cash transfer program gives debit cards. This gets the firms to use more POSs. It gets consumers to get more debit cards, which then also gets firms to use more POSs, okay? Okay, great. And then just to look at consumption, he looks at uh, what happens to where people spend money um, and where people are, are, are you know, uh, where they're consuming or purchasing goods, okay? And he splits this by corner stores and, and supermarkets and also splits it by income quintiles. So basically what you see is that the rich, uh, the top income quintile basically reduces how much they go to supermarkets and goes to corner stores. Okay, so think of the rich as probably the guys already having these Visa debit cards and they never used to go to corner stores because they don't want to use cash or they used to go to them less because of cash. And they start to switch a little they start to go more to corner stores and, or not more, but they reduce the number of times they go to supermarkets and uh, go to corner stores, right? So the spending goes down and you also see it in the trips. So again, you see the number of weekly trips go down to supermarkets and the ones to corner stores go up, but mostly in the top tail of the income distribution, okay? It's not changing how much the lower income or even the beneficiaries of this uh, use corner stores and businesses, but it does change the top tail. Okay, it's sort of like, oh, if I want a couple of things, I'll go to the corner store now instead of going to the supermarket because at least they'll take my debit card. That's how I think of this. Okay, so what happens to sales and profits and welfare? Um, Sean has a pretty nice way of of estimating welfare. I'm not going to talk in detail about how he does it, but I encourage you to go to the paper and have a look. Um, but I'll give you the headline results. So corner store sales go up by 6% and profits increase. He can also look underlying what drives this and he doesn't see any big cost increases. In the supermarket sales decrease, uh, but they also then reduce inventory costs. And so there's not a huge reduction in profits. It's still small for the supermarkets. So they kind of adapt on the cost side. And then he estimates welfare gains to try and understand where are the welfare gains for the consumers. And he shows that ha over half of the total consumer welfare gains are from the spillovers. They're not from the direct beneficiaries, that, but they're from the spillovers where households who did not get the visa cards actually went and got debit cards. This sort of implies that the indirect network externalities here are large. Um, and so this is kind of pretty impressive that the spillovers is what's driving the gains here rather than the individual beneficiaries. Okay. And that's a really nice exercise in the paper. Um, okay, good. Let me stop there and just see if there's questions about this. Okay, so let me then go on to the next set of papers I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm going to now talk about a couple of papers and shift away from this kind of private sector piece, right? So Sean's paper is about how does the, the adoption of digitization and digital banking tools it, by households affect firms? Um, I want to now step back from that and look at the public sector. Okay, so the next few papers are going to be pretty much public sector based, okay, and trying to understand how does digitization affect the public sector and public sector payments? So the first two papers are gonna be um, papers by Karthik Morali Dharan and, uh, and his co-authors, Paul and Sandeep uh, on, on digitization in the public sector. Okay? Uh, and thinking about what I call G2P. These are government to people transfers. So the first paper is about smart cards. Um, you know, India undertook this massive, massive uh, biometric ID program called Aadhaar. Um, ah, good, I'm gonna stop for a second and go back because I have a question on, on Sean's paper, which hopefully I can understand. Um, in Sean's paper, they find an increase in aggregate consumption or a shift from supermarkets to corner stores. Yeah, so they found a, a shift mostly. I don't think they were aggregate gains. 
There, actually, the debit cards themselves had a bit of aggregate gains in consumption and savings, uh, but not a big one. Um, and the gains in welfare come from just thinking about having more choice. And the, like I said, the debit cards themselves have some effects. And so these spillovers to consumers who don't get the debit cards, uh, getting debit cards is big. They get big gains because now they can use these debit cards in multiple places. So I think that's what the gain is, is from the benefits of that. Okay, good. Any others? I'll wait a second and just see if there's any others on this. Please feel free to use the Q&A liberally. I'm trying to keep track of it. Okay, so let's talk about uh, smart cards in India. So Aadhaar was kind of, I think it's one of the biggest or the biggest kind of biometric ID rollout. Um, they rolled out a biometric ID to about 1.24 billion people. Uh, this was about 90% of the population, okay? And the idea was to have a biometric ID. This means an ID that's linked to your fingerprints, yeah? Um, and then the aim of it was to try and apply it to public goods and government programming. Um, and this is sort of a pretty ongoing and controversial discussion in policy. Um, and even the empirics are kind of interesting and, and mixed, as we'll see. Um, and it's partly because of the inclusion exclusion trade off. Okay. Um, a, a lot of proponents think this is a big game changer for governance. It's going to improve governance and reduce corruption and fraud a lot. Um, and the cons are people feel like it undermines the right to life in some grand sense because, you know, there is exclusion worries. There are people who don't have biometrics. It might not reach the exact last mile. You're still missing 9% of the population, which in India is still a big number. And so people worry about the exclusion piece, you know, and kind of bits and pieces around privacy are starting to, to show up as well. Okay, so the first paper on other that I want to talk about, and there'll be a bunch of them today, is uh, this paper that Karthik and all have on smart cards in the ER. Here they roll out the, they randomize the rollout of smart cards. So they work in Andhra Pradesh um, and 157 sub-districts. And what they did was the rollout wasn't just the biometric ID, it was integrating the biometric ID with two public public works program or two government programs. Let me not call them public works. One is uh, NREGS, which is a public works program, and then SSP, which is a pension program. Um, and this affected about 19 million people. So, um, you know, they had 112 treatment uh, subdistricts called Mundals that received the smart cards in 2010, and then 45 control that received them in 2012. Okay, and they're gonna, they're gonna collect a bunch of data to try and understand the impacts of this. Um, you know, they'll also use admin data, audit data, survey data. It's kind of a big, massive data collection exercise and a pretty impressive one. Okay, so this is kind of the, the districts in the treatment and the control. You can see the non-study ones, the treatment and the control. Uh, in the eight districts they were in, approximately 20 million people. And you can see the kind of how they're spread out, okay. Okay, great. So let's talk about the payments experience. So the implementation was not complete. Um, around 50% uh, of payments were carded, meaning they were authenticated uh, with Aadhaar after two years, okay. And you can see on, um, the on the pictures how much of an erega was was uh was on the on the on the sort of on the, on the other and how much was not uh over this period up until 2012 okay so the blue solid line is the percent of sub districts um the dotted line is the percent of ground punch hats, and then the blue bars are the percent of carded payments okay so implementation was not complete but you know but it did grow over time and get better over time um, here's uh, what happened in, in, uh, in the actual payments. So these are four charts showing treatment control differences in the time to collect your payment for NREGS, the time to collect for SSP, the average payment delay, the number of days before you got paid, uh, and the average payment variability in days. Okay? And you're going to see that the payments are dispersed faster, more timely, in a more, um, more you know, kind of reliable way, they're much more predictable. 
Okay, so that's one of the big impacts it has is try to make payments a lot more reliable. Um, and then we also see a reduction in leakage. What does that mean? You know, people worry that in some of these programs, there's, for example, an NREG says ghost workers. I'm the program administrator and I sign up a bunch of people for a payment, but they don't actually work, okay? Because now you have to authenticate with biometrics. It's kind of much harder to do that, not impossible, but still harder to do that. So they look at leakage and rupees in both of the programs and they see kind of a big reduction in leakage uh, in NRAGs and one in, uh, in SSP as well. Um, and it's a pretty big reduction relative to the control group, okay? You get rid about, of about 40% of the leakage um, relative to the control group. <coughs> it's not perfect, like I said, because you can still get leakage uh, because you can still have your friends come show up and use biometrics. It, it's just much harder and raises the costs of that sort of, you know, leak, leakage of payments and so reduces it. And that was one of the pieces uh, here that was very key to the functioning of, of the programs. Okay, um, so let me tell you a bit more about their results and then I can take questions. Please add questions to the chat. Um, what are the margins of leakage reduction in Enrega? You see a 32% reduction in over-reporting. Okay, this is what I was explaining. You can have people sign up uh, and get payments but not actually work. The access to the programs did not fall. So the nice thing about the study is they take the admin data from Nareg's and they can compare it to household data, looking at which households participated and how much they got, and then get a sense of leakage. That's how they're doing the leakage piece. But they can also see access and see whether, you know, people are less likely to use these programs because they feel like, or because program administrators are kicking them out. And you don't see that. You don't see any drops in access. And in fact, if anything, you see higher participation in, in uh in the public works program in the treatment areas. Okay, so it actually improves participation. Um, they also show that the distribution of key outcomes in the treatment first order stochastic dominate those in the control, which means no one is worse off. It's not like some people are worse off and some are, <coughs> are better off. And then they also do this nice piece, which is they get self-reported opinions of the smart cards to understand how people think, or think about them or perceive them. Um, and people do have positive views. They, they like the smart cards, um, maybe because they perceive that it will reduce corruption and leakage. Um, and the improved payment experience comes from converting villagers to the new system. Okay, so that's kind of the full set of results they find. Basically, if you try to authenticate some of these public works programs, you do get reductions in leakages um, and if anything, improvements in access. Okay, let me stop here and take some questions before I go on to the next paper. Uh, Nadia is asking, has anyone studied the impacts on people who are left out of Aadhaar due to discrimination? Yeah, I don't think so, Nadia, not that I know of. Um, it's certainly an important question. I'm not sure I, I've seen anything kind of trying to understand that um, in any systematic way. Uh, I think there's a lot of reports and stuff, but I haven't seen a paper trying to understand not just how many are left out, but how do we try to integrate them into this system if they're left out? Yeah. Okay, other questions on this? Okay, let's try and go on to the next paper kind of motoring through these. So I hope people will stop me at some point for questions. Okay, so the next paper is another sort of Karthik, Paul and Sandeep paper um, on looking at PDS with reconciliation. Let me describe what that is. So PDS is a program in, in India, another public program that alleviates uh, hunger and it provides fixed monthly quantities of food uh, at token prices to, to households. It's not to everybody, but to a bunch. Um, it is probably the largest component of their safety net um, and 1% uh, of GDP, but there's high rates of leakages. Um, Arani, I'm gonna assume that the cost of the program you're asking about um, is uh, the cost benefit on the previous 
uh, the paper does do a cost benefit and comes out positive. Um, so there is work on that in that actual paper. Yeah. Um, you'll see a different version in PDS in a second, right? It's not a given that everything will, will be a, a, a good cost benefit. And I'm gonna show you that now. Okay, so this is the largest component, the PDS of, of the safety net. It's about 1% of GDP, like I said, but there's high rates of leakages, okay? Um, an estimated amount, it was like 42% in 2012. Okay, so what do these authors do? They're gonna do two pieces. They're gonna do, again, other based biometric authentication for PDS. Um, and they're gonna randomize that across 132 blocks in 10 districts. Um, in, a, in a different area, it's not AP. Um, and it's got a, about 15 million beneficiaries. And they do this in two ways. The first piece is they experimentally vary the other based biometric authentication, okay? The beneficiaries who are supposed to get this um, kind of get Aadhaar, they seed the Aadhaar to their PDS account and then every transaction gets authenticated. And then the second piece is the government is gonna do a second step which is something they call reconciliation. They're gonna basically go back and say, hey, if I gave you 10 kilos of grain, but your beneficiaries only picked up five, you still have five left. So I don't need to give you any more for the next month because you only have five beneficiaries, okay? So they're gonna do, the program will do reconciliation. That's not experimentally varied, but the authors will use quasi experimental methods to study the reconciliation piece. Okay, um, and that uses transaction data from the first piece of this to determine how much grain I should give you uh, based on your past history of grain, okay? So there's two pieces of this, right? The phase one is very similar to what they did uh, in Andhra Pradesh with, with Naregs. This is, is not just that, it adds this reconciliation with the distributors of the grains, okay? The stores that distribute them. Okay, so this is kind of, <laughs> a description of the two phases. Um, on the left is phase one, which is the other based biometric authentication, which I'm going to call ABBA, also because ABBA is awesome. Um, so you kind of have a machine, you authenticate your fingerprints, you go to this fair price shop, which is the, we're going to call it an FPS that distributes that grain. Um, and the government has already given that grain to the fair price shop. You go authenticate yourself and you get the grain you're supposed to get, okay? And then, like I said, the phase two is like taking the data from what grain you got and going back to the government and saying, okay, this fair price shop only distributed X. We gave them Y, how much do they need tomorrow, okay? And you can reconcile these accounts back and change what you do or what you deliver to the fair price shop in the next period or the next month, okay? So that's kind of the reconciliation piece. All right, so how did um, the policy work prior to ABBA? Prior to ABBA, the, every, every shop would get their full entitlement amount every month, okay? After the treatment and control get, and then what happens with the authentication, the treatment gets these POSs that I showed you to authenticate for Aadhaar. Um, the control does not. Um, after these EPOSs are distributed, um, the government's going to reconcile wheat, wheat and rice. They won't reconcile sugar, salt, and kerosene, okay? Um, and then what they'll do is they'll say, okay, I'm going to reconcile. I'm only going to disperse kind of the stock amount you need to meet current month entitlements. So if you had too much last month and you didn't give it out, you can push that forward to this month and I'll give you less, Okay. This means that the dealers or these stores are responsible for the grain that they should that they should have accumulated in the past. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that basically, you know, the treatment FPSs uh, could divert this grain, right? If you got too much stock, what could you do? Well, you could go and sell it to people who did not have um, the who are not beneficiaries, right? Or, you know, some of it could have gotten spoiled. So this notion of reconciliation is supposed to prevent leakage of the program, but it also could be a benign interpretation that if they're spoiling, it kind of penalizes the dealers for this, uh, for this, uh, this reduction in stock, okay? All right, so what are the potential impacts here? It could reduce leakage in two ways that I just mentioned. 
you can't divert transfers in the name of people who don't get them. So there's no ghosts. We're going to use ghosts a lot, right? When I say ghosts, I mean, these are people who are on the roads is getting benefits, but don't actually either get the benefits or shouldn't get the benefits, okay? So um, it can divert transfers in the, in, in the name of ghosts, and it could increase the bargaining power of the beneficiaries, right? Without authentication, the dealers won't get a future dispersal of the grain from the government, right? If I have no beneficiaries, I have a stock of grain, they're not gonna give me any more. Um, but both of these mechanisms also risk exclusion, right? What might I do if I can't, if I need to authenticate you, I might give you less than you're, than you're required or than you're entitled to, um, and then give that out to someone else. So I could try and pass on sort of, you know, I could try and protect my rent seeking by restricting how much you get, even though I can't restrict who gets, okay? Um, and this means that, you know, the dealer might actually have more bargaining power rather than less. <coughs> okay, just to show you the first stage of this, remember the only randomization came on the ePOS machine side. You can see kind of these basically pretty good take up of the ePOSs in the treatment areas, very little in the control. Okay, so the first stage is quite strong. Um, here's kind of a summary of the results and then I'll show some pictures of them. Uh, at the first end line, the control group leakage was about 20%, uh, but only 3% were ghosts, okay? Um, and then ABBA by itself had no measurable impacts on the average on the average value dispersed, the average value received, leakage, quality of goods received prices. Okay, so it basically has no impacts on leakage as of its own, just the EPOS itself in this case. Um, but the thing it does do is it increases the transaction costs for the beneficiaries to collect benefits, right? Because you now need Aadhaar and you need to do a transaction with your biometrics that match. So they measure these increased costs as 17%. Um, and they find an increased probability of not getting any benefits. Some people just don't go get their benefits anymore. That's 2.4 percentage points. If you scale that up by the treatment or by the sort of populations, this is about 300,000 people losing their benefits. Okay, it's quite substantial. Okay, just to show you leakage, you can see kind of really no big effects on leakage here. A uh, slight increase in rice, but not really, and nothing in the others. Okay, so this is kind of the effects of the EPOS on leakage, and you find really no effects on leakage here. Um, you know, if you look at the value received, you can see the value received basically doesn't change except some of the worst off lose a little, okay? But it's not a big change. Okay, let me talk about disbursements. So this is, that was just ABBA on its own. They now look at ABBA plus. What is ABBA plus? It's plus the reconciliation piece. So they first look at what the EPOSs do in the treatment control. And then using quasi-experimental methods, they're gonna look at what happens when reconciliation happens. Because remember reconciliation happens after the treatment. <coughs> okay, and one of the things they do is, remember only rice and wheat were reconciled, not sugar, salt, and kerosene. So they're gonna compare reconciled and non-reconciled commodities, okay? So you can see the first seven months, this is kind of the average disbursement value per individual, okay? Um, and then as you see reconciliation come, <coughs> there's a reduction in the disbursement, okay, in, uh, in the treatment, even in the control areas as well a little. Uh, this sort of rebounds by the end of the reconciliation period, and then you see there's no change for the non-reconciled commodities, okay. Um, if you look at the value received by, um, by individuals, so what did the individual say they received? You can see that kind of reconciliation does has a, 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 a again, a reduction in the value received. It does drop <coughs> relative to the control and relative to the kind of non-reconciled goods, okay? So you're seeing kind of this reduction in the value dispersed um, in, in, uh, in these ABBA, in, in ABBA plus. Okay, so just to kind of uh, summarize some of the results and, and think this through a bit more, you see a big reduction in the value dispersed in treatment, right? It's a 37% decrease 
Um, and two thirds of this is actually a drop in leakage, which is good, but there's a remaining loss in value received. So here you do reduce leakage, but remember in the smart cards, there was no effect on uh, service delivery and there was positive perceptions of the whole thing. Here, you reduce leakage a ton, but at the same time, you're also reducing the value received by households. So there is a change in service delivery here, okay? Um, in control, this is better in the sense there's a 19% drop in dispersed value, but most of that is leakage, okay? And that's coming from the reconciliation piece in the control, okay? <coughs> And then they use the experiment to do a clean slate. Imagine I take away reconciliation or not reconciliation, but I take away kind of the responsibility for the past leakage. That's the piece of the reconciliation that's most salient is, do I make you responsible for what happened in the past? And what do they find there? You know, there's a small reduction in leakage. It's very, very small and an insignificant increase in value received. So basically the EPOSs don't do much on either end. They don't change leakage that much, but they also don't change service delivery. What does change things here is that both reduces leakage but makes service delivery worse is kind of this reconciliation process, okay? The holding dealers for the past stock is what's responsible for kind of reducing the amount of, um, of, uh, of, goods, of goods that the recipients should receive. They're receiving less than they're entitled to. Okay, and so the way the government manages transition is kind of with the, by holding dealers responsible for the past stock so quickly is kind of what leads to this reduction in service delivery. So here, you know, I like these, like when all is said and done slides, um, the risk of exclusion while attempting to reduce leakage is very real here, right? They attempted to reduce leakage, but it did create exclusion. Um, and these shadow costs of controlling consumption might be higher than the direct costs, right? When, this, when the dealers get squeezed on rents because they can't fake as much or they can't produce ghosts as much or whatever as well, they can't leak as much, they're gonna try and pass on that rent squeeze onto the recipients and squeeze kind of their benefits. Um, the other piece is, you know, that's worth saying about this paper is, you know, this was very quickly done. Um, this was done in six years, sorry, in six months. The entire program was implemented with the reconciliation in six months. Um, if you compare it to smart cards, those were rolled out over three plus years. So there's a lot more time to kind of adjust to such a big transition. The other thing is the smart cards program really focused on the beneficiary experience. They weren't as worried about the fiscal savings. You know, in this program, it seems that there was such a, such a concern about the fiscal savings, such an attempt to, to sort of get this fiscal savings, which is why they did that dealer reconciliation so fast that uh, it kind of undid the, the consumer or the beneficiary side of the experience. Okay, I'm gonna pause there for some questions. I don't see any in the chat, but I'll wait another second just in case. Okay, should we move on? Let's move on, okay. So the next piece I wanna talk about, it's again, the next two are all gonna be kind of public works programs, but um, both of these are gonna be, what do we do when we start to both authenticate public works programs, but also bundle them with the financial system, okay? So I'm gonna talk about this paper on uh, NREGs and bank accounts and gender uh, by Erica Field and her co-authors. And so this is the public works program NREGs and it guaranteed 100 days of work at a fixed wage to people. This is the smart cards program as well. It was uh, part of the smart cards intervention. Um, and they work in Madhya Pradesh to look at sort of women uh, and NREGs, okay? Um, so what happened was as Aadhaar came in, the first piece was the smart cards program, right? I just wanna biometrically authenticate. And then what they started to do was this kind of direct transfer uh, what they call DBT, direct beneficiary transfers. So not only do I sort of authenticate you with Aadhaar, but I transfer the payments into your bank account so that there's no cash in the system. Okay, and so the payments go directly into bank accounts. Um, and so, you know, 
originally what they were doing was wage payments for all household members were sent into the bank accounts of the household head, okay? So this is gonna be a bit like kind of Emma Riley's paper in some grand sense, just not with mobile money, with the financial system and with a public works program. So this is kind of what the design of the experiment is. They took a, uh, they looked at just women um, and they, they split these uh, localities, grand panchayats into sort of five groups, a control where nothing happened, uh, a group in which the women got bank accounts of their own, um, a group where they got bank accounts of their own plus direct deposit of, of NREG's money into their own bank account. Um, and then they crossed both of these with training, okay? So bank accounts with training and then accounts direct deposit and training. Okay, so the training crossed each of these. And the idea was to try and understand what happens is you give women the ability to not just get wages, but for those wages to be in an account of their own, uh, under their own control, okay? And so here's some of the impacts. So it's gonna boost inclusion and autonomy. So they have these in indices of basically, you know, um, do you use the account? Um, everything is gonna be indices in these papers and I'll refer you to the papers to look at how they're constructed. But there's an index of an account use. There's an, uh, an index of how much you know about the bank kiosks uh, and there's a banking autonomy index. So they basically find that these accounts plus direct deposit plus training have big impacts on account use and on knowledge and information and autonomy. Um, you know, the accounts plus direct deposit do a little bit, but not so much. Um, and the accounts plus training and the accounts on their own just don't do much at all, okay? So, you know, most of this is coming off of not because people are getting accounts, but because the wages are actually ending up in the accounts directly for these women. <coughs> and then they look at what this does to labor supply. Um, they have an aggregate labor supply index. They have two of them. Um, you see increases, at least in the short run of labor supply, okay, less so in the long run, um, though the, you know, the coefficients are not small. And again, you see this only in this sort of accounts plus direct deposit plus training group, okay? So there's something salient about not just having an account, but having the money show up in your account. And this is very consistent with Emma Riley's work on mobile money showing the same thing, right? They gave accounts to everybody, but you know, it was the folks that got the account plus the loan deposited in the account that had effects on their businesses. Um, and then they look at both public labor supply and private labor supply, okay, for these women. Public means working on NAREGs and other public works programs and private labor supplies in the, in the other sectors. So you kind of see not just um, increases in labor supply, but you also see increases in uh, work in the private sector. So not only are these women who have these accounts and the money coming into their accounts, they do more work in the public sector, but they also do more work in the private sector. Okay, and so the question is, you know, why is this happening? What, what piece of this is important? So they then look at effects on empowerment and women's empowerment. If you remember, Emma did find effects on women's empowerment. Here, they're not going to find any effects on women's empowerment. Okay, so there's no actual effects on empowerment. Okay, so they start to think about what is, what's the mechanisms behind these effects if it's not affecting empowerment? Uh, and they start looking at norms. So they create a bunch of norms. Uh, one is a personal beliefs norms. One is a working women acceptance norms. And one is a husband's acceptance norms. And these are the female reports of these, okay? So the idea is trying to um, measure whether norms around beliefs of women's work, whether women, husbands will accept women working have changed. Okay, and these are the fem female reports. So you do see that the norms have changed for women. They think it's far more normal and far more acceptable for them to work. And they think their husbands think it's more acceptable for them to work. What's striking here is actually there's no effects for the men. So the, the men's norms don't change at all. Okay, and these are actual norms, not perceived norms. So a really nice piece of this paper is they try to distinguish between actual norms and perceived norms. Actual norms are what you think the norms are. Perceived norms are what you think other people think the norms are. Okay, what is the perception of norms in your area? What do you think those are? So the actual norms for women change, but the norms for the men don't change. And then they look at perceived norms 
again, by these three indices, and they find that perceived norms do change. So, you know, my, much as the men's own norms don't change, they do think that the perception of norms has changed around them, that it's more acceptable for women to work. Okay, and so this is the mechanism they identify around how these, you know, bank accounts with the Nareg's wages paid into them affected kind of labor supply. It's because women, women's own norms changed and women's and men's perceptions of norms in the area changed and that loosened some of the constraint on female labor supply, okay? Um, you know, they also, just to talk a bit more about the paper, they rule out savings constraints as being a mechanism for this because everybody gets accounts and there's no effect really on savings. They rule out um, general equilibrium wage effects because there's no shift in wages. And they rule out that other fixed costs like childcare and finding work matter here. You know, overall, this is kind of a, a, a really interesting paper because it starts to show you that, okay, norms matter for sure. Women and men bear social costs when women work and these social costs to men may be larger. But also that, you know, behavior can change norms, right? They didn't actually target norms specifically right? They, they didn't try and uh, do a norms intervention. They didn't try and change people's norms. They just changed the behavior on a, on a very economic side. Um, and uh, that's kind of what changed the, 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 the sort of norms. Okay, good. There's lots of questions. So let me take questions. What's the training about? Uh, Ramiro, good question. It's a training on how to use your bank account. It's a bank account training, basically. Um, it's a mantra. When were norms measured? All that I, sh everything I showed you was end line norms. All of these are end line norms. So it's impact of the treatment on the norms. Uh, Arania training I already talked about. Right, so account and deposit. Yeah, so some of the training is just, how do you use your account? How does, um, you know, what are the benefits of accounts? Stuff like that. Yeah, good. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's uh, power on into the last paper I have for a discussion. Um, this is a paper by Prabhat Barnwal, uh, which is again more in welfare and banking, um, and a very and and has a bit of kind of where I'd like to end for the day, which is why it's the last paper on deck today. Um, thinking a bit more about policy and the political part of policy. Okay, so what does uh, Prabhat do here? Um, this is a paper that studies India's, again, direct benefit transfer policy. So if you remember this, this is uh, not just use bi using biometric, auth biometric authentication, but trying to actually deposit your benefits into your bank account rather than using cash, okay? So that's kind of the aim here. It's a direct benefit transfer program. It's gonna be a very different context than a, than a, than no regs, which we saw in the last paper. Um, and so this is gonna be in the context of a fuel subsidy. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second, but the policy reform on DBT changed how subsidies are dispersed for in-kind programs, okay? Um, they removed over-the-counter subsidies uh, and transfer the subsidies directly to beneficiaries. So he wants to ask, how does this affect leakage, which is what we've been talking about, but also how does it affect black markets and ultimately the people who are accessing all these markets, okay? Um, so let me talk about this particular program. So the setting he's gonna use is cooking fuel. This is an LPG subsidy program. Um, the government subsidizes the price for households on LPG, but they also tax the commercial users of LPG. So there's these kind of two different prices depending on whether you're a household or a commercial user. Um, the policy change was a DBT, like I said, which transferred the subsidy to the beneficiaries. So what happened was instead of households going to buy LPG from someone, and if they were a household, they would get it at a price you know, lower than the market price, they would have to pay the market price and then the subsidy would be transferred to them in their bank account. Okay, so the empirical approach is gonna be similar to the one that Chan used. It's a different in, difference and difference using two quasi experiments. I'll talk about those in a second. Oh, actually there they are, right there. Um, the first is phasing in of the policy across districts. 
So the rollout was phased in and that's what he's gonna use in a difference and difference. And then the policy was unexpectedly terminated in the lead up to the election. Um, and again, you know, this is gonna be another one of these India papers with really great admin and survey data put together to understand all these bits and pieces. Um, I, I really find these papers so impressive in how they do this. Okay, so this is kind of the leakage in the LPG program. Um, if you look at the census and the national sample survey, the, you know, there's about 30% of households who report using LPG, um, but on the, on the ministry side, it's sort of 45 percentage points. Okay, so there's a 15 percentage point leakage uh, in this program. Um, here's kind of the subsidy and the tax. You can see the price is approximately whatever it is, in this case, a dollar and a half. There's a subsidy of about half a dollar per kilo uh, that goes to households and then uh, a, a tax of about uh, the same, even though, sorry, those should look more equal than they are. <laughs> um, so you get these kind of two extreme prices in the market. And so there's an incentive for the people selling LPG to kind of divert the, the subsidized LPG to, uh, to the higher price guys, right? So I wanna, I wanna say this was, I wanna claim this piece of LPG was subsidized uh, and then sort of divert it to the commercial users so I make more money. Um, enforcement of this is really, really difficult and there doesn't seem to be any sort of credible punishment. So you get a ton of overreporting through these ghost accounts. Audits reveal many millions of ghost beneficiaries in the system. You know, these are people that um, the distributors are claiming are households that got those benefits um, and they sold to them at the subsidized price when in reality they didn't and they sold it at the commercial price and pocketed the difference. Um, and then there's a large informal sector, which means a bunch of this diverted stuff is sold on the black market. It won't be sold at exactly price plus tax because it is a black market. It's diverted from the official use. Um, but there's you know, a lot of transactions in the black market. And actually Prabhat does a survey of black market prices uh, in a pretty neat way in the paper. So I refer you to the paper for more details on that. Okay, so this is the dual pricing that exists around LPG. Um, so with, um, with the direct benefit transfer, like I told you, the fuel is sold at the non-subsidized price. The subsidy is transferred to bank accounts of the beneficiary, and this is all verified with Aadhaar. Okay, so you basically, Get your, get your fuel registered with other and then uh, go back and get your subsidy in the bank account. There's no subsidy to non-compliant beneficiaries. They buy fuel as usual and with no subsidy. Um, and that's the idea here. Let me try and get rid of leakage in the system. Uh, all of this would work very well as long as you know agents don't find new ways to manipulate the system or the technology doesn't fail to deliver in some way or if there's a displacement of fraud in some way. And I'll try and show you those results. So here's the rollout of the program, okay? Um, it, it sort of has three big phases or six big phases actually. There's a transition period, there's an enforcement period. And then, like I said, in March, 2014, it all gets abandoned in the lead up to the election, okay? Um, and you can see kind of 20 districts start off first, then 22, and then uh, another 249 are sort of in this transition period before it gets canceled. And then there's non-policy districts as well, which just never, uh, never get treated. Okay, and Prabhat is gonna use this kind of rollout across these different phases to look at the impacts. Um, the other thing that's worth saying um, is, you know, the election kind of shut it off completely um, and they were worried about kind of you know, these dealers being a special interest group and, and sort of cutting a lot of their leakage and this having political consequences for them. There's a quote that Prabhat uses, which is really cool. It's from, a, it's a former minister. And he has this quote saying, as a politician, I'm telling you that 90% of the LPG dealers and black marketeers in the state are either politicians, bureaucrats, or their kin. Okay, so there's certainly this concern that this is gonna backfire in a political sense. And so it gets stopped and then the new government actually reintroduces it in, in 2015. Okay, so that's kind of the context. Let me show you some results. So here's the impact on domestic fuel sales, okay? So the blue line is the control districts, the red line is the, the treated districts, okay? And you can see this big reduction in the number of refills 
uh, of fuel sales, okay? So this is the reduction in leakage, okay? Um, basically, uh, I can't, you know, because I'm authenticating and getting uh, subsidies directly to me, I can't claim these kind of ghost people buying LPG at the subsidized price. So that's domestic fuel sales. Let me show you commercial sales. Uh, you see an increase in commercial sales, as you can see the red line. And this is because, you know what happens when, uh, when I can't divert fuel, right? There's this black market I described, right? I'm gonna say there's a bunch of people who are eligible for the subsidy, they took it, I have this extra fuel I can sell on the black market. What happens here is you get a supply shock to the black market. You don't have that extra fuel to sell on the black market, which means, um, you know, a bunch of people who are buying on the black market were probably commercial buyers and they're gonna have to buy at the commercial price now. So you see an increase in the, in the, in the treatment districts on commercial sales. Okay, and then, um, you know, Prabhat follows the black market. He's gonna look at the black market after the termination of the policy, okay? He can't look at it before and he's collected these black market prices. So when the policy gets terminated, guess what happens? Supply goes back into the black market and you see a fall in price, okay? So you're gonna see this fall in prices um, in, the, in the black market, in the black market prices, sorry, in the treatment districts, not in the others. And then finally, he looks at the non-beneficiaries. So the guys who don't get DBT or uh, aren't getting the direct benefits uh, and what happens to their fuel purchases Remember, they can't go to the black market now, so they have to buy it at the right price, at the market price. And you're seeing um, a reduction in their purchases. Okay. Um, and you can see as, uh, as the policy gets terminated, that purchase of theirs ticks back up right here at the end. Okay. Good. And then, you know, we always want to ask what's the impact on delivery? You can cut leakages. What happens to delivery? This is kind of delay in LPG or service delivery or quality of delivery. This is the delay in the refills delivery. And you can see a slight increase in delay to start with, but then it kind of peters out to be even lower. Okay, so there's a small short term, it feels like transition cost and service quality. That's right here, right at the beginning of the policy being phased in. And then it kind of disappears and becomes uh, actually better, if anything. Okay, so this is another example where, you know, it's like the first Aadhaar paper I showed you. There's a, a, a sort of a policy that tries to reduce leakage. Here it's actually going to not do much or, if anything, improve service delivery and reduce leakage a lot. But it gets terminated because of these political constraints and lobbying on the side of, of, of the folks who were getting rents. Okay, so when all is said and done, one of my all is said and done slides, um, you know, the enforcement of the subsidy uh, reduces the purchase of subsidized household fuel, as I told you, you get a supply shock in the black market, the higher prices in the black market lead to increases in commute commercial fuel sales through the formal market, right, I showed you that too, you know, there's little evidence of he finds little evidence of displacement and fraud. It doesn't just move around somewhere else. So unlike the PDS system where they did move the fraud around, how by reducing the quantity, you don't see that here. Um, and it suggests that these effects kind of stayed. And then, like I said, the service quality doesn't decrease significantly. The only piece that sort of is really interesting about this is that, you know, the political impediments are pretty strong and salient here, right? Um, because the people getting rents get their rents cut so heavily, there's a, a lobbying to undo this policy because of those rents. And it does get undone before a political election. It gets put back in, it might get undone again. So the political constraints can be quite important. Um, you know, in the previous paper, this was about rushing the, the implementation and trying to hold these dealers responsible. Um, and if they can't push back against the rent cut, they'll find another way to gain rents. And so I think trying to do all these digitization policies can have big effects on leakages in a positive way, but there are gonna be a set of political constraints that limit how much you can do this, especially if you try to do this really fast, uh, which is what both of these both of these last two programs I talked about did.
Okay, let me stop there and see if there's any questions before I take stop. Yasmin, I see your question. I'll refer you to the paper on exactly how they measure norms. It's mostly kind of, you know, whether people do have control over decisions. Um, yeah, so that should be in there. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna take stock and briefly wrap up since I don't see any other questions. Um, Look, digitization has a variety of impacts, especially when combined with integration into the, into the banking system. And as we saw, especially for women, if that integration into the banking system is targeted individually and not householdly, I know that's not a word, I apologize, but I think you know what I mean. And so if there's individual kind of targeting of the banking system, it can have big benefits, especially for women. Um, but exclusion can be a real concern as well. Um, you know. The exclusion comes from sort of concerted efforts by the, the, the people who get the rents in the system to use that as a way to regain the lost rents. Okay, and so I think thinking carefully about how to minimize that exclusion is, is really important as we start to digitize more of these and integrate more of these with the banking systems and the financial systems. They provide gains to those that don't get excluded, but there is this exclusion piece that becomes important um, and even more so important if uh, the public, you know, if the programs are income targeted and so they're already amongst poor people and you're creating exclusion amongst poor people. And then, you know, the implementation and political lobbying remain as important concerns or constraints. So being aware that cutting rents in a quick, sharp way might have pushback in ways that will undermine all the gains or could undermine the gains is kind of important to understand and keep in mind. Uh, I don't think, you know, to me, one open question is how do you try to fix those pieces, right? How do you try to get support on the political side or the implementation side for some of these programs? And can that uh, kind of, you know, undo this constraint on the, on the implementation and the politics side? Okay, I'm going to stop there. I know I'm five minutes early, but I'll wrap up there. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody who taught in this module uh, on credit and risk and insurance. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here and for the folks at the IGC and LSE and BREAD for organizing this. Um, thanks, everybody, and I'll stick around for a couple more minutes if there's any more questions. Uh, good question, Abdul Razak. No, I don't. I, there isn't one. Um, one of the reasons I think that there hasn't been much work there is, you know, all these digital credit products are monthly loans. It's very hard for a farmer to like pay off a monthly loan. If I want to buy fertilizer today, I don't get my harvest for four or five months. And so this monthly loan is not a great agricultural loan. So I think, you know, on digital credit, I one thing I didn't say, which I will say now is, you know, all the products are the same. It's all a monthly loan. Not everybody needs a monthly loan, right? If I go to an, a bank, in, if, if I go into a bank in the US, I'm offered 50 products. That's not true in this digital system. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done to expand the, the product, you know, to expand product diversity and what products households have available to them, uh, especially for agricultural households, because you know, a monthly loan is just really hard for them to pay back. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Maybe I'll wait one more minute and see. Okay, I don't see any more questions, so I think we should call it a day. Thank you, everyone.